All right, this is Bob Davis, and we're here at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame uh, induction ceremonies, year 2005, and I'm here with uh, Mr. Sammy Strain, and he's a, a native of New York, and he's he's being inducted as one of the members of the OJs. But uh, Sammy's got a long and storied career, and he's like I said, he's a native of New York, and we're just going to let him tell us about his career and. Uh, Welcome to SoulPatrol.net Radio, Sam. Uh, thank you, Bob. Uh, well, I'm, a, I'm, I'm from Brooklyn, New York, originally. I grew up in Brooklyn, and uh, I guess I, I started out, well, I'm from Best Dive, uh, area of Fulton and St. James Place. Mm -hmm. And uh, I heard, as a matter of fact, I heard that's where uh, Biggie Smalls is from. Uh, uh, yes. He's from St. James. And, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, also, though, I found out a couple of years ago, I was attending this ceremony in uh, Los Angeles, in Beverly Hills. They were uh, honoring Morgan Freeman and a couple of other people, and I, they was having this silent auction. So uh, one of my favorite actors, uh, Lawrence Fishburne, was at the silent auction. I walked up to him and said, uh, uh, you know, Mr. Fishburne, I really admire your work very much and whatnot. And shook my hand and introduced myself. We shook hands. And, and, um, he said, I enjoy your music also and whatnot. So we started talking to him and said, where are you from? He says, well, I'm from, from, I was born in the South. I grew up uh, as a baby. I came to Brooklyn. I said, man, I'm from Brooklyn too. I said, I'm probably from uh, you know, a place you never heard. I'm from uh, the St. James place. He said, man, I'm from St. James to the left. It's the same block. <laughs> I said, get out of here. He went crazy, man. And he picked me up and said, my homie, my homie. He was walking around the place. The rest of the night telling Bob Hope and this Taylor, this is my boy, we're from the same neighborhood, you know. <laughs> so, uh, and then, uh, and then uh, a couple of months later, uh, I was at the Soul Cafe here in Manhattan, mm -hmm. uh, on 42nd Street. And uh, whenever I come to town, I used to go, because the brother Malik Yoba right. owned it, you know. Right. Um, from New York, New York to the company. New York yeah. to the yeah. right. And the night I went in, Denzel Washington was there because he was in town shooting, uh, he got game. And I just played Coney Island. I saw this movie stuff out there and come to find out he was shooting this movie. And he only goes at night. Mm -hmm. So he stay, he sleeps all day or stays up late. Um, and then he goes out there at night for this particular shoot. And we were talking and he used to date a chick from St. James. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's a small world. It's a very small world. Yeah. Yeah. But, but anyway, I started singing. Um, uh, in Best Eye, um, I met this little group of uh, four guys I went to school with, and uh, we wrote this song called Rubber Biscuit, which was a, a novelty record and became a, a big hit years later by um, Dan Aykroyd and John Belushi, the Blues Brothers recorded it. Okay. Uh, but we were already together for one year. But uh, uh, it was Paul Fulton, Sh uh, Shedrick Lincoln, Nathaniel Epps, we called him Lil John, a guy named uh, uh, Charles Johnson, who we called Ken Bond, and myself, Sammy Strain. And we had this little novelty record, and that was my introduction to our uh, show business in uh, 1956. Uh, we played the Apollo Thanksgiving show, Dr. Jive, uh, Tommy Smalls, WWRL. And from that point on, um, I sang with another group uh, from the neighborhood called Fantastics. We had a hit record called They Was My Love, we were RCA. And then from that group, I went on to um, sing with a, a, a group called The Impacts. Um, well, we had a record called Canadian Sunset, and then from the impacts, I, I uh, well, early on when I was with the uh, Fantastics, I, I met uh, Richard Barrett. Mm -hmm. um, we did a gig with the Valentines, and um, then of course he went on to produce uh, Frankie and I and the Teenagers and the Chantels and whatnot. So years later, when I was in the Fantastics, I met him. He produced the tune on us. And we became very uh, good friends, and uh, I used to go over to Manhattan sometimes and hang out with him. And I, so I got a call from him when I was singing with the Impacts, asking me uh, that, uh, uh, that I want to sing with the Imperials, right? Which I had gone to school with Ernest Wright, um, who you related to. Ernest Wright is my <laughs> uncle. He's, <laughs> al uncle. He's also the uncle of Vernon Wright, who right. is Soul Patrol's Los Angeles coordinator. Right. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> right. So Ernest and I went to uh, Alexander Hamilton, and I used to see Tracy and Clarence and them. And I knew Anthony from when I sang in the Chips, he sang in the DuPonts. Mm -hmm. So we all sort of knew each other. And at this particular time, uh, uh, Anthony had left the group um, to do a single first time. And um, 
So he asked me, did I want to sing with the uh, Imperials? I said, yeah, you know, great. So we hooked up. And um, so it was Ernest, uh, Clarence, a gentleman by the name of George Kerr, mm -hmm. who later went on to to produce the OJs. That's right. Um, OJs, the Escort. Yeah, that's right, right, right. Okay, well, George Kerr and I sang uh, in the Imperials. Then George Kerr uh, split. And uh, Kenny Seymour came aboard. Okay. Uh, um, uh, so, but anyway. Uh, so then, the, the, let me just interrupt for a second. So, obviously, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame will probably induct Lil Anthony and the Imperials at some point in time. Yeah, so I heard you. Yeah. Okay. So, when that happens, you will be, become one of the few people in the history of popular music to pop to be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame twice. Yeah, like the Johnny Carter. Like Johnny Carter yeah. from the Dells yeah. and the Flamingos. The Flamingos, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I, I, sort of, I sort of knew that. Uh, <laughs> of course, I, you know, as I talk to people, uh, they have to say, man, you're going to go in twice. And then I've uh, talked to people uh, from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and they realize that they say, well, eventually, you know, you will be inducted twice. So I, I, I'm, I'm sort of looking forward to it. You know, I mean, I hope I'm, a, I'm, I'm around that long if they don't take too long. You well, know? hopefully the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame will take care of that very quickly. Because yeah. I think that yeah. most anybody that's listening to this would agree that Lil Anthony and Imperial, most people probably don't even realize that Lil Anthony and Imperial is not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Right. Yet. Well, well, as I was saying, getting back to the story, uh, um, I hooked up then. Uh, what happened, Richard Barrett uh, produced me with the Fantastic. Then he, he assigned the uh, Imperials to Carlton Records and uh, with George Curry and we had this fabulous record called um, uh, Faithfully Yours which uh, also I just knew it was going to be a smash which, which it wasn't and, and, <laughs> and then uh, uh, we started putting the act together and started working and whatnot and shortly after that we uh, Ernie Martinelli who was handling Anthony as a single uh, sort of suggested you know why don't you guys Anthony wasn't really doing nothing we were really doing nothing so we decided to regroup and at that time, we met uh, Teddy Randazzo and Don Costa, and they just started DCP, uh, uh, a production company uh, label, with United, distributed by United Artists. And of course, the rest was history, because uh, then we became adult, uh, contemporary uh, artists. We recorded uh, three songs that went on to become standards, instrumental, uh, thousands of vocals have probably recorded them, going out of my head, outside looking at it, hurt so bad. I've heard about everybody from Johnny Mathis, some of the songs, Barbara Streisand, Sinatra, um, uh, Nancy Wilson, uh, Gladys Knight, some of everybody, you know. So that sort of put us on the map. What well, we had grown up out of the teen pop or bubblegum thing, and then by the time we recorded these uh, contemporary standards, we start becoming uh, adult nightclub performers, mm -hmm. which led to us working in Las Vegas and uh, places like uh, Puerto Rico, a fine supper clubs, uh, Copacabana in New York, things like that. And uh, because of that particular era where we met the Teddy Randazzo and, and uh, Don Costa, you know, the music went from the Shimmy Shimmy Coco Pop era, uh, it tears my pillow to, like I said, going out of my head outside and looking in. And, uh, and at that point, it's just like we start doing the Ed Sullivan shows, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Johnny Carson. Les Crane, the Today Shows, you know, uh, Merv Griffin's, uh, Mike Douglas's. Yeah, I remember seeing y'all on yeah, TV when yeah. I was a little boy. So, so, um, and uh, that's how it started. And then, in, um, that was big, I think about 63, 64. And then in 1972, I moved to Los Angeles. And uh, shortly after, I left the Imperial uh, uh, And uh, I opened up a a steakhouse in North Hollywood with DR one with the Red Fox called Meat Rack. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. and the, oh, it was oh, it was great. It was uh, it was it was really fabulous. And there I was from the stage. Now I, I I'm in the restaurant business, which I, I knew nothing about. But my partner, this guy named Alan Potts, he was uh, uh he was my business manager, and he always wanted to do something like that. And I was no longer singing, and it sounded like a good idea to me at the time. And it was very successful until uh, it was the only restaurant next door to Universal City Studios at that time. And we had uh, uh, business was great because we had to, we were next door and they worked 24 hours because, you know, it's a factory. Mm -hmm. And um, 
So we did, I would say, 70% of our business from, from the studio. And we opened for lunch, and, you know, then uh, uh, to 3 o'clock, from 11 to 3, then again at 5 o'clock until, uh, I guess, closing. We stopped serving dinner at about 10, 30, 11. We closed at about 2 in the morning. Uh, but it was it was quite a, an adventure. And we were doing great. We were going to open one a year after the first year uh, uh, around the L.A. area, maybe five the franchise. Well, we were had just found our second location, and um, I came in one one day at one time. The place was a ghost town. And my partner was in the office, all shaking. He said, oh, guess what? What? Universal went on strike. Ah, oh, right, the strike. So, you know, you figure strike three weeks forward. Strike lasted 17 weeks, and we did 60, uh, 70 percent of our business in the studio. Right. So, uh, just killed us. So, we had an uh, opportunity. Some people had been spying the restaurant because we had great reviews. Few critics said we had the finest restaurant that had to open up in a decade in the Los Angeles area. And when I would come in, I'm serious, everybody from Raymond Burr to uh, uh, Dinah Sands was still alive. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, she would eat there when she'd be shooting on the lot. Uh, um, Telly Savalas, I'd see Bob Stry I'm some of everybody. And, and, and it was a nice rest restaurant. It seated about 300 people, uh, parking lot, about 300 cars. And uh, it was, I was really impressed with the restaurant myself, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, but the writer's strike happened. And uh, we ended up selling the place because we had a lease on it for a couple of years to another gentleman that owned the restaurant in Beverly Hills, Hills called Will Bears. And uh, shortly after that, believe it or not, I got a call from uh, Charlie Atkinson, Pop, right. asking me um, would I like to understudy for William Powell, of course, the old days get they go on their first big major tour headline. So what, year, what tour. year are we talking about? This is now uh, 19. Um, I left Lord Anthony Pearls in 70, 73, probably. And... I also was working for this, oh, I had the restaurant. Then after the restaurant closed, I, for a moment, I worked for this record distributor called Me High Records uh, in Los Angeles, who opened up a chain of uh, uh, record stores called Peaches Records. They had one in Atlanta. Mm. They had, the same, they had two in St. Louis, Hawaii, and, and uh, they were all over the country, And which I loved because I was still around music. And while I was doing that, I got the call, so in 1976, into 75. Uh, it was um, it was like November '75. Uh, take that back. It was December of '75. Okay. And um, they were starting the tour in uh, in the January first, end of January, last week of January, into February. I had got the call and I said, Yeah, you know, I was just going to be an understudy and do the tour for like uh, nine weeks. And um, I said, okay, that'd be great. So I met with their manager uh, at the time, Barbara Kennedy. She lived in Los Angeles. Of course, Ed Watts still lived in uh, Cleveland. They were in Shaker Heights at the time. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, Pop was living in uh, um, Las Vegas. Well, he was still in Detroit getting ready to move to Las Vegas. Any, uh, anyway, I met with her at this uh, restaurant. Now, I didn't know prior to that for about a whole year they were trying to uh, find someone. They were auditioning people and whatnot. And when I met their manager at this restaurant, Beverly Hills, as soon as Barbara she walked Kennedy. in, your yeah, Barbara Kennedy, uh -huh. as soon as I walked in, she looked at me, she said, you're the one. I said, big part, and she says, I don't know what it is, I just got a feeling that you're going to be the one. So um, we talked, we had dinner, and she says, go home, pack your clothes, you're going with me in the morning, we're flying to Cleveland. Uh, of course, the, the time is of the essence, we only have three weeks, and uh, uh, what Charlie Atkins tells me that, you're a quick learner, and uh, um, you'll be able to uh, do the job, which takes up nine weeks to learn the show. I had three weeks to learn. Mm -hmm. I was scared to death. But anyway, I packed my clothes. And the next morning, I flew to uh, Cleveland, and uh, no, I didn't. We flew the next night on the red eye, because I got there that morning, that following morning. And uh, I met with Papa, but I guess about 7 o'clock I got in and uh, they checked me in my room and I laid down for a while. And the rehearsal was at 12. At 12 noon, Ed Walk and 
and uh, we talked to them because I knew them also. I met them a few times in the past. I was fans for OJs. And then um, after, you know, we talked for a minute, I said, everyone said, okay, Pop, you said this guy is, is good and this and that. Went, okay, let's see what we can do. And we started uh, running over the stuff, and I learned the. I was into the third song only after an hour and a half. So what happened uh, when Barbara Kennedy um, came back to the rehearsal hall and she would say, how's it doing? And they called a little meeting and said, you know what? Forget being an understudy. You're going to do this tour. Mm. And uh, we're going to now get all this pressure on me because they said that Will's going to go in the hospital. And um, you're going to do the tour. You're not going to be an understudy for many times. So now I'm like, whoa. So they uh, they sent for this guy from Los Angeles, the designer, Mike Travis, the next day, and people were fitting me for clothes. And, and, uh, you and were that, OJ. And yeah, and, and that, <laughs> and, well, yeah, but just for, uh, but I still was going to be just, uh, be, um, I was going to do the tour just for nine weeks, though, at that point. Right. Um, so what happened, now I started realizing the pressure, but not really realizing, because now you're going to have to go out there and do it, you know, for real. It ain't about, watching them on stage and if Will gets sick and can't go on, you know, I, I would suit up and go out. And three for three weeks, man, I think I was out there doing it twice. They kept locking me in this room seven days a week from 12 noon to 6 in the evening. That's all I did. And then after I would have dinner at night, I had to go tape recorder and I'd listen to the stuff and try to run over by myself. And um, there was the first show. Uh, was the first week of February? It was the first week of February. Was the first show, and we were in Buffalo, New York, and I was so nervous. The Commodores was on the show, and I forgot who else. I think Blue Magic, and I was just a nervous wreck. And uh, I went to the bathroom prior to the show, and just called my nurse, said, "Man, you can do this." <laughs> and I went on out there, got suited up, and did the show, and uh, didn't blow anything. But wouldn't you know, the next night, we are in Canton, Ohio, Ohio, the OJ's hometown. And I go out there and start flooding steps, right? And then after that, uh, by the third day, I, I, you know, I really had it down at that point. So I, I just, uh, now we're into the tour. Mm -hmm. And it's about the, the beginning of the ninth week, the last week. And I'm thanking everybody on the bus, you know, guys in the band, in the section, and I didn't walk. Man, thank you, you know, for this next week. I said, what are you talking about? I said, well, you know, the tour's over. This is the end of the tour. It's the last week. And, uh, you know, I just want to thank you guys for, you know, letting me come out. Well, I said, man, you're crazy. <laughs> you ain't going nowhere. You're an OJ. <laughs> I said, what? He said, yeah. I said, William Powell will come back. It'll be four OJs, but uh, you can't never leave the group. I said, oh, wow. And I, now I'm really overwhelmed because I never expected that. So here I am back in show business again but even bigger, you know, and, and, and greater than the, uh, the success I had with Lil Anthony well, Girls. Well, just, just let me, let me interrupt for a second. Number one, I would say that when you, while you were in the restaurant business, you just, just not, just my, this interaction, mm -hmm. I can, I can say that you were probably still in show business when you were well, yeah. in the restaurant business. Right, but. You got that kind of personality. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, I was a, a gracious host, but, uh, and I met a, a lot of people could be next to the movie studio. Right. But. Uh, it was it was like totally different uh, uh, than actually being. I was on, of course, being cordial to guests, but it wasn't like being on on like when you're on stage and show business. Right. Uh, but I had to find a way to uh, even when I was performing, I had a way that when I did leave the dressing room, I wasn't on. Uh, you know, I was off. But I see a lot of people never they never they're always on. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that would drive you drive me crazy. You know, I, uh, there was one of the things I used to tell Bert a lot. Uh, um, he had that recognizable face, you know. And the same thing even when I sang with um, Little Anthony Imperials. Um, like, I feel sorry for people who are recognizable because I call it living in quiet elegance. The fact that you could be anonymous and just after the show, they see you on stage. I come on stage and put on my glasses and a hat. I can walk on by just Bert, but Bert can't. I can't do that, you know. Yeah, yeah. His face is... I, I mean, like, uh, even Walter can do it. And by first, I guess, being the feature lead vocalist, the same thing with Lou Anthony Pierce, Anthony being the feature lead vocalist, they just stand out. 
And I love that because um, a lot of times when uh, I be with the Jays and we'd be doing the 20,000 seaters and there'd be people backstage, I would go in the dressing room and, you know, change my clothes and I would put on my hat and my glasses and I would help Andrew. Andrew was uh, Eddie's uh, brother, Andrew Roberti. Uh, he, he was a wardrobe man. I would help him carry this stuff out to the car. I throw a bag of clothes <laughs> off my shoulder and go on out past the crowd, right? And, 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 and uh, dump the bag in the back of the limo, uh, uh, limousine, excuse me, and then get in the limo and wait for the guys to come. And sometimes they used to bust me. People would say, where's Samuel? <laughs> there he is with that bag with, uh, uh, with Andrew trying to sneak away, you know. But it, 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 I guess I guess to, the, to your point, it, it does enable you to leave a, a quote-unquote normal life also. Well, you know what, though? But that lasted, I mean, sometimes it was like that. I, I, I tell you, though, know, one, I was living in Los Angeles for, uh, I lived in L.A. for 18 years. Moved out there in 72 while I was still uh, singing with the lawyer for the Curtis. And uh, when I started singing with the Jays, because uh, like I said, the stuff I did with Lou Anthony Girls up was great in the 60s, and we started working in nightclubs in Las Vegas and whatnot. But the music had changed by the 70s where um, two acts could pack Madison Square Garden, where in prior to that, we'd have uh, greatest show of stars at the Uptown Theater in Philly or the uh, Fox Theater in uh, uh, Brooklyn on Flatbush Avenue. Uh, uh, you would have uh, Marvin Gaye, The Temptations, The Four Tops, Tom Jones, Lou Anthony Imperials, Jay and the Americans, Mary Wells, Stevie, all on one show four or five shows a day. Um, this was like in 63, 64. I remember even early now, I used to go see Jackie Wilson and Sam Cooks and things like that. I mean, I mean, excuse me, people like that. By the music had changed so big, had gotten so big and so phenomenal. Uh, when the Motown sound came out in 64, 63, and the English sound followed with the Beatles and all of that, that was the music explosion that was heard around the world. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, our music was on the at the end of the dial, you know, at the black station. 1600, the station. WWRL. Yeah. Now, right. in the mid-60s, 63, 60, I'm 64, 65, 66, when the Temptations record dropped, when Smokey Robinson Miracles, Dion Walworth, Lil Anthony Imperials, Tom Jones, Dusty Springfield, everybody's record was played on the same station at the same time. They dropped it on white stations as well as black stations mm -hmm. because there was a music explosion revolution. So now, let me tell you, let me tell you what happened. Let me tell you what happened. We used to do integrated tours, Dick Clark. There would be white and black acts, mm -hmm. okay, on the tours together. When we did the Murray K shows at the Brooklyn Fox, it would be um, an integrated show. I mean, it, it would be uh, the Supremes, uh, Jay and America. There would be the, the New Beats, which is the white act. There'd be the Contours. There'd be Lou Anthony Imperials, Dusty Springfield. All on one show for 10 days, you know? And then, of course, we would leave there. And then we'd go to the Uptown, which basically it would be uh, all black, but sometimes there'd be some of those blue-eyed soul brothers that would be on those shows. I've seen white acts at the Apollo Theater, like the Skyliners, you know, things like that. But that was a rarity. But but during this time in the six between '64 and 1970, um, I would say '70, '73, '74, we were all played. It was you didn't have to cross over at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, you went from being at the corner of the station played black music, and then you had your, your top 40 pop, you know, McGuire Sisters, Pat Boone, all that, and they would cover black music, like uh, the, the uh, McGuire Sisters would cover uh, Moon Glow Sincerely or The Spaniards Goodnight Sweetheart, right. and they discovered this great record. We already knew it was a smash, right? Absolutely. Okay, well in the 60s, with 64 to 70, that was, forget that. Now white kids could take home the temptation. They could have took home the Spaniels then or the Moon Glows because it was all right because of this English sound, this Motown sound. So now we were played on all the dials. Mm -hmm. the, mu the music wasn't segregated anymore. Dionne Warwick uh, record was played on black and white stations. Lil Anthony Pearls, black and white stations. Temptations, black and white stations. So when you looked at the, the um, uh, cash box top 100, the top 40, 25 of the records was black. 
because they were from Motown, they were from um, 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 uh, out of New York, a uh, Burt Backrack with G.R. Walwick, Teddy Randazzo Step with the Anthony Pierce, Step the Records, you know. Mm -hmm. So, but what happened, point being, how it separated again, the music got so big that when I used to do the Murray the Case show, for example, it would be the Temptations and the Supremes would be two of the acts that were on it. Of course, the Miracles would be there, and Contours, uh, Jane and America, like I said, Dusty Springfield, Tom Jones, The Times, mm -hmm. you know, the Chiffon. So what happened during that era, the music, the acts started selling records so much, they start getting so big that by 1960, I would say 60, 60, 64, 65, by 1969, instead of the Supremes and the Temptations doing five shows a day at the Apollo or the Uptown or the Murray K show, along with 10 other acts, the Supremes and the Temptations could sell out Madison Square Garden for one night now. And instead of making 15 or 20 grand a week, they could sell out and say do anywhere from Fifty to seventy thousand dollars for the night. So let me, let me ask you something uh -huh. because this is this is this is a great topic to talk about, right? Um, because this is and it's something we've talked about on Soul Patrol a lot. Um, they're, they're, if you read historian uh, historical books about rock and roll music, right? They always refer to this period between say nineteen. 1959 and 1964 as almost a dead period. Right. In, in, in their histories, because they're basically saying, well, after Chuck Berry went to jail and Little Richard, you know, uh, turned to religion and Elvis Presley went into the army, right. nothing happened until the Beatles came along. No, that's but, not but so. At, absolutely, and that's this is part of what you're saying. Yeah. So, so that that's one thing. The other thing is, is they they say that the only after the Beatles came, there was no real big impact on music. Until Woodstock, and then Woodstock. no, 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 no. Okay. okay. Well, first of all, when when Chuck Berry and Elvis went in the army, and you, who was the other person? You Little Richard uh, and Little Richard became a minister. Right. Yeah, but shit, you had you had Sam Cooke, mm -hmm. you had Jackie Wilson, mm -hmm. who was show enough superstars who 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 did it better than anybody. Mm -hmm. I mean, the only person that could follow Jackie Wilson on stage was the people cleaning up the building. <laughs> I'm serious. So I mean, I, I mean, but not only him, but you had a lot of other talent. I mean, I, I don't remember everybody uh, at this moment because when you need it, you can't call. But I'm just saying, just to name a few. You had so many people, um, and and uh, the Apollo Theater didn't close down. Uh, uh, um, Murray K didn't stop having shows. Uh, they didn't stop having shows at the Uptown, the Regal. So somebody was selling records and somebody this guy was playing something, but here's what happened. When the English sound came, it was not only just the English sound, it was the Motown sound. Because the English sound, when you hear interviews by the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, they tell you straight up. We were influenced by Muddy Waters, Bo Diddley, Chuck Berry. Black music is our foundation. Okay, uh, um, uh, Howlin' Wolf, people like that. Well, that's how they learned to play this stuff. It wasn't uh, 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 Bill Haley in the Comets. Uh, I mean, Christ, that was a rock record, but like Little Richard was the person that, that, that hey, he's the architect of rock and roll. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Everything come after that. Mm -hmm. But they also were influenced by, by um, um, oh man, so many people. Um, I see some of the people uh, Muddy Waters, you know, uh, 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 all those great blues artists. Buddy Guy, one of the gentlemen that's being inducted uh, into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame with us tonight. Well, you two and all these cats and, and Eric Clapton, they idolized these cats from Chuck Berry to you name it. So black music was always there. Uh, 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 what's from Jerry Lee Lewis is going to be here tonight. He, he's from the South, he listened to black music. And Elvis Presley became one of the first people. He, 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 he went to black churches. They listened to um, Great Balls of Fire. They listened to this, the Buddy Holly, black music. So black music has always been the root. So when Elvis went in the army, Little Richard became a minister and, and other gentlemen, uh, music didn't stop rolling. It continued to flow. Because like I said, you had your Sam Cooks, uh, you had your uh, Jackie Wilson, uh, you still had Bo Diddley. You had all these people, Solomon Burst. You had all these people that were still out here uh, um, 
then uh, um, Aretha Franklin's, uh, young Aretha Franklin's. Uh, uh, you still had uh, vocal groups like the uh, the Flamingos and, and, and the Cadillacs. I mean, all these people in different parts of the country were still putting out music, you know. So, but what happened when the English sound happened and the Motown happened at the same time, those two influences is what started a whole new trend. And what it did, it unsegregated the music because once Motown became uh, a black, a popular black music that white kids could take home and play freely. Prior to that, they they didn't well they took the home the a music home but played it on the slide. They couldn't come in the house and just turn on WWIL. You know what I'm saying? They was listening to Martin Block and and uh, Make Believe Ballroom and and you know I mean the top forty. Uh, Lily White stations, right, you know, right. but on the download they was listening to, to, to the stuff because they were going to the Alan Freed shows and things like that. Well, when Motown came, Motown when the the mothers start wearing their hair, uh, 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 wearing the heavy makeup and wearing the go-go boots, and the fathers start wearing their hair long uh, with the long sideburns, looking like the Beatles and Engelbert Humperdinck and stuff like that. They started dressing like their children. Uh, they wanted to be in. Uh, I mean, so they were doing the fruit and all the dances. They started uh, dressing mod. Mm -hmm. you, you know what I'm saying? Uh, uh, so, so now, this if you wasn't into the new Motown sound, then you wasn't into nothing. One of the things that we've done at Soul Patrol, we've actually gone back and looked at the charts between 59 and, and 65. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it keeps saying, it keeps saying it's dead. We did the kind of analysis that you just described no, a little earlier, mm -mm. and you look at all of the great music, most of it being produced by blacks, even though these are, this is the cash box and yeah. billboard charts, you know, it's like, that was actually a very, very strong period for music, um, despite what some of the historians might say. No, they don't really know. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, that's just like critics. Uh, they critique for themselves, but they can't speak for the masses. So fast forward to the 70s again, because now, mm -hmm. How does, it, how does it flow? You, 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 what I heard you say was that by the time you get to like 69, now you no longer have to have these shows that have 15 artists. Well, no. Well, first of all, here's what's happened. The artists are making so much money. Once, once a promoter said to um, a Barry Gordy or to the agencies, or the agency case, listen, uh, we got a great idea. Let's go into Master Square Garden with the uh, Supremes and the Temptations uh, for one night. Okay, Mass Square Garden sees 20,000 people. Right. Shit, the Apollo Theater, what, 1,700? Right. And you're doing five shows a day for 10 days, and you can go into Master Square Garden and do um, a two and a half hour concert, you know, with intermission hour and intermission, and sell the place out. And, 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 and maybe, I mean, gross maybe at that time with the ticket price, I mean, gross, gross up to close to $70,000. You know, which or close to a hundred thousand dollars with the little merchandising and everything. Right. So now that means that the Supremes and the Tips don't have to sing but once. Now if they're doing the same kind of gig that tomorrow night in Boston and the next night in DC, so for the weekend, say they gross three hundred thousand dollars where they would work the Apollo for a week for maybe fifteen or twenty. The uptown top, uh, the uptown for fifteen to twenty, another week, and then the royal. That ain't but forty-five thousand dollars for for twenty-one days work. <laughs> wait, wait, uh, 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 seven days a week, forty-five shows a day. You know, for forty-five thousand, and here you did Friday, Saturday, Sunday, each night an hour performance, and y'all gross three hundred thousand dollars. That's a no-brainer. So. Now you got more longevity, but you're playing to more people, and you're playing bigger venues. So in turn, that's what killed the tail end of the black vaudeville circuit, because now these artists ain't got to, I mean, this is how we learned, though, and we loved it, because that was all that was available to us. Right. But now our music has crossed over all boundaries. And not only do we just have this uh, party from, but now we got the whole 
it's not only Americana, but it's world Canada. Now you can go to Japan, you can work in Germany, England, France, or South America. And that's what happened. So now, now the artists are selling certified gold, certified platinum, which prior to that, you, you could have sold five million records and they only told you that you sold uh, uh, 500,000. I mean, you know, uh, 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 and you could have sold five million because then they started certifying the things. And then you start seeing, well, now you cut on your TV. I remember back in the 50s, man, the Ed Sullivan had this little spot for 15 minutes uh, called uh, Spotlight on Harlem or Spotlight at the Apollo or something. He had, he had Bo Diddley, the Five Keys, and the Verb Baker. I thought I had died and gone to heaven, man. I've seen these three black guys on Ed Sullivan show. I mean, I hear their music on the radio. I've seen them at the Apollo. Now they're on Ed Sullivan. Well, that was a rarity. Once that English and Motown sound happened in the 60s, and we had Shindig and Hullabaloo where the action is, uh, Lord Thaxton, um, uh, we just had all kinds of uh, uh, Hollywood, a go-go, shivery. Now, you see black acts on a TV show that's getting viewed by anywhere from 15 to 20 million viewers. Now you see the Temptations and the Supremes coming on that show. But then they, they, they also had their own special. But yeah, they right, 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 right. So now, so now the acts are getting bigger. So with that kind of exposure, so that's what was lacking. But here's what happened. When the acts started separating again where we should be all integrated at first with the Murray Case and Alan Free shows. Once the acts could work these big venues by themselves or with just an opening act, they started playing the music on the radio like that again. That's now the OJ's got to cross over mm -hmm. to the pop chart with a record like A Love Train. Prior to that, Fifth Dimension, like I said, Lou Anthony Prince, we just played black and white for that 10 year period. As soon as the record come out, it wasn't about no special promotion, man, to work the uh, the black stations. The uh, the black promotion man or the white promotion man, they went to all the stations. Sometimes they hung together because everything was being released like that. Now you had, still had some odd, hardcore R&B stuff, I, I, I must say that. that that didn't come out pop. When I say this, don't get me wrong, there were uh, blues singers and, 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 and uh, um, perfect example. B.B. King probably uh, still was dropped R&B first, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But the fact that the Supremes and the Motown sound was now a pop sound. Uh, Dionne Warwick, Fifth Dimension, Lou Anthony, we had that pop black sound, you know. And no longer was the Maguire sisters and Pat Boone on the charts because remember they used to cover black music. Now the black artists are doing their own thing. It's been accepted by the white audience. So, there's no way to so that killed the Maguire sisters and the Pat Boones, the, the, the fakers. Mm -hmm. you, you know what I'm saying? They never hit the charts again on the picture because they were exposed by that time. It was like people wanted the real thing. Perfect example. Do you know how many white sing up? Uh, a stand-up doo-wop groups they had when I was singing, man. They would be on the shows doing the routines and stuff. But what would happen, once you saw them Cadillacs and the Flamingo, all those black guys, <laughs> after you saw a move and whatnot, it was like, even the white kids were talking about, well, damn, they're not as good as the, 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 the Cadillacs, or they're not as good as the Flamingos, or they're not as good as the Anthony Chris, or the Temptations on the top. I see them trying to do the move, but it ain't coming off like that. Mm -hmm. you know? But hey, they're doing it today. Them Justin Timberlakes and NSYNCs and whatnot, they just doing the same thing that the white groups did. Uh, um, now you know they ain't, uh, they ain't got the flavor, flavor like that. But since you brought it up, let me ask you, because there's a lot of people that, that are very concerned uh, about the fact that Justin Timberlake like will be inducting the OJs into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yeah, well, I thought they could have got, got at least got Usher mm -hmm. or Smokey Robinson. I mean, I'm talking, I'm talking about respectable, certified 
stars. I, I personally, I don't know Justin Timberlake. Okay. I know who I've heard of him. I've seen him, but I do watch Usher. I mean, I stay. Up, I mean, I stay up on it. You know what I'm saying? I like Usher. Um, I think he's a he's a force to be reckoned with, and it's his time. And if they wanted to go old school, they could have got Smokey Robinson. Mm -hmm. I'm, this is my opinion versus but it's like when um, um, was it would they do a tribute to Barry White uh, and it was on TV and the, the young people I had nothing against them uh, that were seeing Barry White song they don't know nothing about Barry White Barry White heard of them and, uh, but once again somebody like Smokey would know Barry White or Gladys Knight, or Dion, but they didn't have Dion Warwick or Gladys. So I mean, uh, uh, we, somebody who who knows Barry White, you know what I'm saying? Right. Right. Uh, nothing against the young contemporary artists uh, that they probably uh, I think they could have had Mary J. Blige or you know somebody, but not putting them down. But I guess somebody explained to me, but yeah, but they're the flavor now. But that's not really being authentic and true to the man that you're trying to honor. Because if he had something to say about it, I'm quite sure he would really want someone that he knew could really talk about him and honor his music in depth versus somebody that heard about him and got the tail end of his life, you know what I'm saying? So somebody like Asha would, would, would probably be able to... Well, since, he, since they want some young flavor, yeah. at least... In Dustin OJ's, I'd rather have, I mean, I would think it would look better to have a Usher versus Justin Timberlake. The man with the watch your mouth. The mouth. <laughs> well, at least you don't have to worry about that. Right. Right. Watch your mouth. No, no, I, nobody, I'm not. I'm, nobody, nobody would care. Right, right. <laughs> I, 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 I mean, it's just like, I think they have Eric Clapton uh, um, uh, uh, either um, uh, inducting you two or the pretenders, uh, you know, Eric Clapton is shit. He's old school, like he's. Uh, Eric, you know, um, so so give me Smokey Robinson. But if you're gonna give me some new flavor, I mean, and Smokey Robinson is a force to be reckoned with, one of the greatest writer producers of all time. You know what I'm saying? And he knows the OJ's very well. I guess it could be argued. And then, like I said, or give me Usher, who is hottest kind of. You know what I'm saying? But it could be argued. I'm sorry. Uh, I guess it could be argued that um, Justin Timberlake comes from a vocal group. Yeah, so is Smokey Robinson. And, well, Smokey Robinson's not out there right now. And I believe I, but you don't have, See, that's what I'm saying. You're talking about out there right now. So what they're doing, that's why they got it. He's the flavor. It has nothing to do with uh, how he can relate to the Jays because he used to sing with a vocal group. Right. right, so he could relate to a group. To a group. So maybe maybe that is the, 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 the argument. But I, I agree with you, with what you're saying. Right. Um, and, and since you brought him up, I just thought I would, would ask about that. Well, I'll tell you what. Give me Ron Isley. He's a singer with a, group, a vocal group. Still not singing with a vocal group. And, is he, and, and he's the flavor now. He's Mr. B. Hey, I have no, you know. I have no, no you know, but <laughs> since, since nobody asked, since nobody and asked, I don't run the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. That's how they see it. Then that's how they see it. But I, I do think I'm that, not, I'm, I'm, but I also appreciate them inducting us because I think it's about time. <laughs> and that's what I'll say about that. But go ahead. Go okay. Well, I think it's important that people be able to connect the dots between. That's why Soul, Soul Patrol is subtitled "Great Black Music mm -hmm. from the Ancient." to the future right because the, the dots have to be connected and, and one of the things that i think is a problem uh in today's uh, uh music world is that the dots aren't necessarily being connected for younger people right and they, they may not always understand that um you know i i mean i saw um snoop dogg right. do an interview right this was about 10 years ago right and they said well who who do you listen to mm -hmm. so he mentioned some some names of some artists um and then he says, well, you know what? When I'm with my lady, I throw on some Barry White and some Teddy Pendergrass. Right. And whoever, the person that was interviewing him said, well, that's surprising. So well, that shouldn't be. That's, you know, those are the kind of people when you're with your lady. Right, right. <laughs> You want to be with, you got, right. you know, with, with some, real You deal. want me to put some rap music right. on? Right, I want a real deal. Yeah. Right, right. So, you know, but now fast forward 10 years, 
uh, a lot of younger people may not even be able to make that connection. So right. I think that that's what you're talking about, is that Usher probably makes that connection to the OJs. Right, right. I'm, I, I mean, well, it's just like uh, he's aware of, uh, I think, his roots. That's what I'm trying to say. I, 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 um, Justin Timber, uh, Timberlake wouldn't know our roots. He may be heard of something here and there, but I think Usher, growing up in a, in, in a black household, and, and a, I would think he would know more about the rooted in music. You know what I'm saying? Like even when I saw him on the um, thing where he did the, uh, uh, it, for Ray Charles, mm -hmm. and he sang Georgia. You, I mean, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And and then James Brown was also there, so he had he had the but you had the new flavor along with the. Uh, how can I say the root? The root. Yeah, absolutely, James Brown. Yeah, uh, the beginning. You know what I'm saying? Let's go back to the 70s. Did it change? Now you said it kind of got resegregated in the 70s. Well, it not not kind of. It did because okay. now you had to uh, uh, cross over again. Um, um, for some reason, like I said, the acts got so big. So we, okay, what I'm saying is when we toured together on the Dick Clark tour, there was a mix tour across the United States of America. Uh, you had you had black acts and you had white acts and we would go out for 90 days, three months. He'd have two tours out at the same time crossing this country. And the tours would it would be um, the I Gets, Little Anthony Imperials, Jay and the Mer So we're selling amazing records together. Well once the English sound and the Motown sound comes and is heavy to the point where now you got all the uh, the white acts. Like I said, we should. I used to go to the Apollo when I was all thrilled backstage. I'd walk in, look backstage. Hey man, what's happening? And, and I, it got I me. Mean, it could be Chuck Jackson or Benny King on the show or whatever. And I, I remember one time I said, uh, "Who's that white cat in the wings?" I was like, "Oh, that's the brother from England named Tom Jones." Uh -huh. <laughs> I said, okay, he in school, all right. <laughs> so, because, because back in the 40s and 50s, when you would look up in the balcony at the Apollo Theater, uh, you would see um, um, Milton Burroughs and and, and uh, um, Jackie Gleason's and all the white comedians watching Moms Mabley and, and, and Slappy White and all, you know, all the black pig meat and all the comedians. They was in school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay? All right? And 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 uh, and then of course you had back in the days of the Cotton Club, uh, which was in Harlem where blacks weren't patrons but they performed there. It was right. white folks. Right. So I'm saying so so so. But back in the 40s they would be at the Apollo, all the comedians and singers and dancers watching the black talent in school. And in the 60s, like I went, walked in, there was Tom Jones in the wings watching. <laughs> and then he became one of the Blue Eyed Soul Brothers. Right. I mean, you know what I'm saying? So, 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 but anyway, we had this Dick Clark tour with all, 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 all this. Now, what happens when, like I said, two acts, two black acts, could tap Madison Square Garden for one night, you know, and sell it out? Then there's no need to be on those Dick Clark tours or play in Apollo for five days, ten days. So, those promotion men. Now they had to hire black promotion men again to take the music to the black stations, even though you could, your record maybe was distributed by CBS, like the Gamble and Huff, for instance, which fell for the national right. level. So they had the pop white jocks that would take it to the pop stations, trying to get. It. I mean, and they would sometimes, but you know the word. It would have to cross over by the time Love Train ran up the black chart with a bullet. And it's and it, and it also was on the uh, the top 100 with a bullet and worked its way all the way up to that that top 20. Well, now we know it's crossed over. Mm -hmm. That's why Love Train was one of the biggest OJ records, uh, uh, one of the biggest singles. Just like used to be my girl crossed over, you, you know. But things like Hooks and Me didn't cross over, mm -hmm. you, you, you know. Or Let Me Make Love to You. But it, but in the, but in the minds of the uh, of the black people, shit, you couldn't get no bigger than that. You know that's why that's our main state. That's why you basically you had your whispers and your your uh, your uh, OJs are a mainstay in the black market, and they're gonna always do well. Pack them in, 
But on the other hand, you got your tips and your tops that sell out every place they go. They hit the national and they uh, they have black people in the audience, but predominantly the 70% of their audience is white. And on the other hand, the Jays and Whispers, 70% of their audience is, uh, is black because they always have that black root. They never really left that base. You know. I, I always had a theory, I, I don't know what you would think about this, but I always thought that the people, it's almost as though the people who are at the top of the music industry sat mm -hmm. around in the conference room and they said, you know what, the more we can diversify, the more we can, you know, cordon off, section off, however you want to call it, the marketplace, actually we make more money. Mm -hmm. The more different kinds of radio stations we have, the right. more different kinds of, of, of touring venues, to the point where it's almost like divide and conquer. If you had an integral, a totally idealistically perfect integrated set of uh, radio stations and musical styles and uh, artists touring, uh, there's actually less money. The whole thing is less money. Right. The whole thing is more money the more segregated you have it. Well, you know what? And, the, uh, and you're right because um, you're perfectly right and it benefits the artist to have it like that now, especially today. Because you have, okay, you got hip hop. Mm -hmm. Then you got what you call hardcore hip hop. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know what I'm saying? Uh, you got alternative. You got rock. You got hard rock. You got easy listening. You got jazz now. You got Latin. You got gospel. Uh, you still got R&B. Uh, um, uh, and you still got pop. Um, before, like you said, if you had less categories, all these people couldn't get recognized because they're only going to let a few rise to the top. Sure, if I got a top 40 chart, for each one of those genres that you mentioned, right. then guess what? Now I can have, you know, if it's 10 different genres, now I can have 400 hit songs at the same time. But I love that because here's what's happening. Uh, uh, okay, you got adult contemporary, uh, um, 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 uh, you got black urban, you got this. When they had it, like I call it pigeonholed in this uh, one thing, it, how can I say, okay, when I was growing up, there was only one Nat King called. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. uh, there was only we had we we had stars, but there was just like one. Uh, Nat King Cole was the ballad deal. Harry Belafonte was that he had that calypso, which is like more of an urban type thing, but he was still pop and and black across the board. You know what I'm saying? We only had one Ella Fitzgerald. You know, wherein shit they had Tony Bennett, Frank Sinatra. Victor Moan, did that, that, but they only allowed us, we only could uh, press this few. Well, today, I'm overwhelmed. My heart, my chest swells up to know that we got Michael Jackson, we got Prince, we got Lenny Kravitz, we got, we can roll them off like that. We got females, we can roll them off. We got jazz, we got every, we got all the flavors. We are the whole bouquet of flowers now. Mm -hmm. We don't have to take the back step to nobody. We're in, so, because if Sammy Davis, if we lost Sammy Davis or Nat, that was it. we lost the national treasure and it may be 20 years before we get enough. Well, we got so many young people today uh, on a creative event, whether it be from Snoop Dogg to Usher to Lenny Kravitz to Michael Jackson to Prince, you know, to uh, uh, to Luther, to uh, Peebo, two of my greatest, my favorites of all time, Peebo Bison and Luther Vandos, by the way, folks. When I say... That is the beginning and end of anything you want to listen to. Not taking nothing away from Usher and all the up and coming people, but when I go home and buy all Luther Vandross albums and all the people and sit down and listen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, but, but so so now we got so many flavors, and then my heart, and, and, and then the, uh, the young. Uh, brothers and the young sisters, man, they, they come out, they got their fashion lines, they got their, they got this, they got, I just love it, you know, plus they own themselves, they got their own publishing, they got this, well, when we were coming up, that was not only unheard of, unthinkable, because we could, I mean, we were just trying to get played, mm -hmm. you know, and we was played, enslaved, and all that other stuff, you know, <laughs> I mean, they worked us, you know, but, so I, I, I admire them, I love their spirit, I love all the doors that's open, so I think we should have all this diversity, and I think it should be 
sacred yeah let contemporary gospel or let the gospel have its thing let them have their wars thing let uh, let hip hop I mean let everybody have it and then we also got it under one roof also because it's all music when I was a teenager uh huh in the, in the early 1970s and I grew up here in New York uh, up until that point in time as you know there was really only one radio station that most of the black people in New York listened to I just WWRL WWRL Dr. Jive was my I just tell you but then around 71 or 72 you had WBLS came into, uh, on, on point with Frankie Crocker with Rocky G Frank, you remember Rocky G? Yeah, Rocky G from uh, RL. Yeah. yeah, Rocky G, Frankie Crocker. Uh, what's my man, the black murder passenger? Um, oh, Al Jackson. H Al Jackson, yeah, people like that. So the WBLS came up, but the music was slightly different than WWRL. WWRL was kind of like almost, um, um, it was it was the root. Hardcore. Like before. Hardcore. It was real, real soul music. Hardcore R&B. You know, hardcore R&B. WBLS was kind of like was a little bit more upscale, a little bit more sophisticated. Yeah, it was it was like you could hear Jimi Hendrix and Miles Davis on right, there too. Right, so right. it was a little bit more. It was funk, right? You know, so you had that. And then at the same time, I don't know if you remember this for a short period of time, for about three or four years, you had WRVR, which was a jazz station, but it was kind of like it was kind of like they were playing Grover Washington and and uh, Patrice Russian and stuff like oh, that. Oh, see, I wasn't living here. Then. You you might have been living on the West yeah. Coast. See, I moved to, uh, uh, I left New York in 72, moved to Los Angeles. I lived there for 18 years in L.A. But so my point is, is that actually the marketplace for this kind of music that, that I liked anyhow when mm -hmm. I was a teenager, it tripled. Right. Because yeah. now there was three radio stations. Of course, of course. As opposed to one. Of course, of course. So, um, uh, let's go back to the OJs for a minute. Mm -hmm. So now it's the mid-70s. You're touring with the OJs, you're recording with the OJs, you're on Philadelphia International. Tell us what that's like. Tell us what that whole Philadelphia International trip was like and, 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 and Kenny Gamble, Leon okay. Hunt. That well, but first of all, remind me to get back to that Philadelphia International. But I just want to, since we're doing it, I want to give a shout out while I can. First of all, I want to say a special hello to my two babies who might punch <laughs> to my daughter Sean and, and my son Vincent and I love you guys okay now this for me to be inducted to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame it's been a long and winding road I started out with a group called the Chips in 1956 who I love and will probably never get inducted uh, the only reason why people know them is because they re-recorded and wrote a song called Rubber Biscuit that the Blues Brothers recorded and sold millions Dan Aykroyd and John Belushi also sang with the group The Fantastics. I want to tell them how much I love and appreciate them. Shout out to them and the Impacts and the Imperials and the Lanthan Imperials. And a special thanks to uh, Eddie LeBert and Walter Williams for letting me become a part of the OJ Music Family Tree of Music and Life. And also along the way, my mentors, Richard Barrett, um, and great producer and writer and friend Teddy Randazzo, great writer, producer and friend and and a uh, gambling huff, great producers, writers, friends, mentors, and a special with all my heart, Mr. Charlie Pop Atkins, mm -hmm. who I admired, who's responsible for me being the OJ. Now, what it felt like to be a part of Philadelphia International. Was, was that your acceptance speech? <laughs> no, but that's, yeah, but it could be because that's okay. what I would like to, I, because that's how I would shout it out. And I know I'm going to do some uh, um, uh, uh, written interviews today also, you know, mm -hmm. publications and some more like this. And yeah, that is like sort of my shout out acceptance speech for, oh. for all the people that helped me. Uh, I like that. Point. You know I like saying? that. So, but anyway, uh, oh wait, oh I got more. Every disc jockey that's ever played every record, <laughs> every technician, every musician that's ever played on the records, every musician that ever backed us up on the stage with every, I, I thank you all. Every fan, trust me. So that covers everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, but before we go to Philadelphia International, there's a person I just want to ask you about right quick who's a member of Soul Patrol. He's been a member for a long time, and I know you must know him, Mr. Jimmy Castor. 
Oh, my baby, that's my brother. That's my father. <laughs> uh, he lives in Las Vegas. He now. lives in Las Vegas. Yeah. That's right. Man, listen, Jimmy Castor, all I can say is, man, what a sweet man. Um, you see, he looks like a little baby. Mm -hmm. That's his spirit. He's so young. Uh, I've never seen this guy um, argue, get upset. He's always been the same temper. Just a beautiful human being. And uh, his spirit lives. I mean, whenever we see each other, we just break into a smile and start hugging each other because uh, we have it like that for each other. You know, I respect him. I admire him. I love him. And uh, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. The E-Man. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now, tell us about Philadelphia. Right? Okay. Uh, first of all, I was a great admirer of uh, um, Sound of Philadelphia, Gamble Huff, uh, uh, the OJs, Howard Melvin, Blue Notes, uh, Archie Bell, and Jones. Of course, at that time, when Backstabbers came out in 72, shortly after that, I stopped performing. That's mm -hmm. when I was with the restaurant. Right. So, and I had known the Jays, uh, you know, previously from that, because I, I saw them at the Apollo a couple of times. And uh, we followed them into a uh, club in Boston called the Sugar Shack when I was singing with Anthony Pierce uh, in the late, uh, early 70s. So when the Backstabbers came out and hit, I was just so happy for them because I knew, I, I, uh, I remembered One Night Affair, Deep in Love and all those things. Mm -hmm. uh, um, lipstick Traces. Because we were years ago on the same label, United Artists out in California, uh, Liberty UA. But when they had this, I knew they had reached international fame, and I was very happy for them. Uh, never, ever, ever imagined that I'd be a part of the uh, OJs, and let alone uh, a part of Gamble and Huff from the sound of Philadelphia. So when I came, I was in awe. Um, I guess the fact that when I was touring with the Jays, okay, doing this, um, uh, uh, um, understudy thing and I actually did the tour then I became an OJ things were happening so fast that I didn't have a chance to grow into it or think about it because I had to execute so they brought me there to do the job that William Powell was supposed to be doing so I didn't have a chance to really get scared think about it or, or can I do it because I only had three weeks to learn it so now I'm in this group that's our super group, headlining, selling out Madison Square Garden, uh, two days in Westbury, Friday, Saturday, and Sundays. I'm uh, the, the uh, front row in Cleveland, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, the Circle Star in San Francisco, uh, the Greek Theater in Hollywood. I'm in the midst of all this. I ain't got a chance to even come down to think about what it is that I'm doing. Now they're going to record. Um, William has passed. And I'll get ready to do my first album. I don't have a chance to think about it. So when I went, I went there, I'm 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 still in awe. Right. And I'm living this dream. It's like a dream world. Because here I am, first of all, being successful in the sixties, or the first looking back fifties, then not successful, then successful in the sixties, Lance and Chris, then not successful having a restaurant I never known I'd seen again. Now I'm with the Jays. And I done went from working little clubs to packing stadiums. So it's a bit overwhelming, but I'm still not letting myself uh, feel it. So now I'm in the studio with Gamble and Huff, and I'm with Joe Taj and Sigma Sound, and all these main sellers come out of the studio. And I'm a part of this main, main selling group. And I'm overwhelmed, but at the same time, I don't believe it's really happening. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm serious. And 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 and, and, and uh, it was like a haze at first, you know. I mean, that first album. And and I guess one of the reasons why uh, they chose me because working with Charlie Atkins Pop told him that I was very disciplined and I could focus on what it was I had to do and not let uh, outside things get in. In which they come to learn, and they are very. Discipline, because we used to rehearse for nine weeks, seven days a week, six hours a day before we went on tour. Nothing could penetrate that. Now, if you can imagine, Dennis Williams, our conductor, Charlie Atkins, Edward, myself, in the middle of the desert, whether it be in Vegas or Cleveland, in a hotel, for nine weeks, seven days a week, from 12 noon to 6 in the evening, rehearsing.
put your show together. And that's discipline. You know what I'm saying? So I had the same ethic, work ethic, when it came to recording. So I knew I had to do what I was supposed to do. And I didn't have a chance to really uh, go, uh, you know, where my hat, gamble up and all that. I had to concentrate on the job that I had to do. Right. Then after I got the first album out the way, though, and I had that first little break uh, after all of this, and I had like that first little six months off after the tour and the rap. Then I had a chance to exhale. And then I, I got scared. Damn, did I really do that? Oh my God. I didn't have a chance to think. I couldn't slow down. So then I started to really understand, man, I'm a, I'm a part of the, the Philadelphia International Stable, Gamble and Huff. Uh, this is like the, the second coming of the of, of music like uh, Barry Gordy and the Motown sound. Motown, right, Motown, you know, yeah. Or, mm -hmm. or, or the Stax Watts, mm -hmm. you know, out of Memphis. So, and I'm a part of this. And then I started to really live in the moment, so to speak. Uh, next time I got a chance to go in, because now I'm, I'm a part of the family, you know, I'm accepted. So I, I got Bunny Siegel and the Fat and the Whitehead, and they calling me by my name, and you know, it's like I'm part of the family, so now I'm living it in the moment. And I, I realized how um, blessed I was to, uh, to be chosen by the Creator to be a part of this. And it was, um, um, to this day, one of the greatest ex experiences of my life, to be able to be a part of the Philadelphia International Family, you know, and to uh, be a member of the same lodge as my brethren, Lou Rawls, Hal Melvin the Blue Notes, you know, Teddy Pendergrass, uh, Archie Bell and the Drills, Three Degrees, um, uh, Oh man, the Ebony's, uh, Phyllis Hyman, Gene Philly, Kahn, Philly Paul. Philly Paul. Yeah, you know, I've got to think about, you know, Philly Paul. So to be a part of this university, I, I, you know, it's like, yeah. So you, uh, you know, and it, 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 folks, it always ends up like this. Here we have somebody like Sammy Strang. Everybody knows you as a member of the OJs and as a member of the Little Anthony Little Imperial. Anthony Imperial. Yeah. But you're not a person that's like right. You know, you're not right at the forefront of people's lips when they start talking about right, artists. Right, 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 right. But here we have somebody that actually can tell us about literally 50 years of musical history, going all the way back to the 1950s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, right up until today. Mm -hmm. You heard us talking about people like Usher and everything else. Right. This is this is the kind of history that you can't get someplace else. You talk about it being a university at Philadelphia International. Right. You are a university into yourself. I mean, and, and that's and, and, and see, I want people to realize and understand that it's not it's not always those names that you see in the headlines. You want to hear something, man? Mm -hmm. I had the pleasure of a gentleman that I admired uh, from afar, and I had a chance. I was married to a, a young lady by the name of Yvonne Fair. She since passed away, but we had divorced prior to that. But um, and she, matter of fact, she used to sing in the Chantels. So mm -hmm. fact, Richard Barrett mm -hmm. uh, introduced me to her years ago, right? But anyway. She used to have her nails done. We lived in Los Angeles at the same salon that Glow Dean would have her nails done. And they became friends. So whenever I would play Los Angeles, I would give uh, Glow Dean and Barry White tickets. But Barry White would never go out because he, uh, he didn't go to shows. So he would send uh, Barry Jr. or, 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 or uh, Bridget, his daughter, whatnot. And they would come. And, but Glow Dean would always come. She was a big fan. And so one day we were at this affair at Pick Fair, they did a thing, uh, they honored Lena Horne and um, my, uh, my wife and Dionne Warwick, uh, they were called the Ladies of Bravo. This is a, uh, a little black social club, like um, their women in uh, Beverly Hills, they have theirs are called Share. Mm -hmm. Well, Lola Solana and June Brown and Dionne Warwick and Leslie Uggams, a whole bunch of them, they, they formed an organization called Bravo. And their goal was to uh, raise money to build a wing, a wing for sickle cell anemia. I, I, I can't remember the hospital at the time. It could have been C's, Sinai, one of six. But anyway, we had Pig Fair, Jerry Buss's place, to, to get the gentleman that the latest. latest. Mm -hmm. So now I get a chance to meet Barry White in person. 
I'm standing there, and he said, man, I, I, uh, I'm looking up at him, right? I call him the General Jack. He said, man, thank you, man. You know, see, you James is a bad man, and, and you always invite my wife and I, you know, to the to the shows and send the tickets, man. I'm sorry, you know, me, but I just, I'm a private person. I don't like to go out and this and that. He said, one day I might come. I said, okay. So he's looking at me. So he said, man, he said, I know you this young cat with the with the Jays and you the new cat on the block with the Jays and whatnot. And I, I, I see you up there stepping and I enjoy you and whatnot. He says, for some reason, back in my mind, you just look so familiar to me like I've seen you someplace years ago. Uh, you didn't just get the prince. So I said, no. I said, I used to sing with a group called Lou Anthony Prince. He said, you used to do the splits on Shindig. Well, Barry White scared me to death. He picked me up and put this bed <laughs> on me and started squealing like a mouse. I knew you were somebody. I knew I knew you. I knew you were somebody. Scared. People started looking at me for the cars, right? Uh, uh, he said, he said, please, man. He says, you got to come over to my house this week and talk to me. Tell me about show business. He said, man, you knew Sam Cook and, and Jack, all the people. He said, man, please come to my house. So I said, okay, I, you know, I'm off. So he invited my wife and I to his house. Uh, we got there in the afternoon. He said, man, oh, wait, no, the first time. We just talked. We talked. He didn't want to let me go. We talked. Hours. We talk, he, and he kept saying, man, you got to write a book. He said, you know, they're talking to me about having some kind of cable show. Maybe you could be my ethnic man. He said, you got so much knowledge. These little people, they got to know what... Because he would just pluck my... This uh, an artist or what year. Or tell, uh, tell me about the children's circuit tours. This and that. So now, next time I come, I bring two crates because I can let groups R&B music from way back when. Mm -hmm. I got ink spots to you name Clovers. Uh, the Cardinals, uh, I mean, some of everybody. So we playing this music, and this man, when I, I used to have to beg to go home, because it would be, i get there like 7 o'clock in the, in the evening, it'd be 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. I'd be talking about, Barry, I got to go, please, man, let me come. He'd be holding me hostages, but his cry was, you got to write a book, you got to be on the show, you got to do something, because you have all this knowledge, and people need to hear this, you know, because I mean, I would just tell them about how we used to, um, um, uh, there would be, a black audience would be uh, to your left, on the right would be the white audience, and you'd sing facing the wall in front of you, and the band would be playing behind you, mm. and, and so both acts, they would be looking across, and you wouldn't be facing nobody, you'd be facing the wall. Or the black acts would be up, I mean, artists would be upstairs and whites. And he was saying, man, people need to, because they, they're taking too much for granted. They don't understand. And I used to tell them how, uh, um, before they built the big arenas and venues, that uh, we would um, do shows at the auction houses where they would auction off the livestock, where well, that would be the biggest venue in town. In town sure. You know, so, and that would be like a little stage where the um, the guy would be talking, hey, give me five, 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 four, 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 you know, like that, where he would have the stage, where that would be where the stage was. And I would tell him the dressing walk, uh, the dressing rooms would be stalls, like uh, Jackie Wilson would be in stall number one. Uh, 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 yeah, I'm serious. Clyde McFadden would be in stall two. The Coasters would have three. The Drifters would have six. Lou Anthony Pills would have this. Uh, um, um, Laverne Baker would have that one. And um, the orchestra, uh, Lloyd Price's orchestra would have uh, a, a, a stall uh, 13, 14, and 15. You know, and he would be talking about, get out of here. I said, yeah, but that's supposed to be the dressing rooms. You know, and then we would come into the middle of this, because this was the biggest venue in town that could hold that type of crowd for a concert, you know, back in the children's circuit days, before they start building, you know, the 20,000 seat arenas and things like that. Well, there's a couple of points I would say about it. First of all, there's, you're already in trouble now. You realize this, because what y'all don't know is that I learned last night that Sammy lives about 10 minutes away from me, so uh, we might have a similar problem to what you have with Barry White, because I'm in trouble. <laughs> so that's at an undisclosed location in New Jersey, so that's number one. Number two, after Barry White passed away, we did a, um, a radio special on him, uh, you know, tribute to his music and mm -hmm. what have you. Mm -hmm. And um, it, during the 1980s, I lived in Houston, Texas. Okay. And uh, um, so Galveston is, is real close by. And Barry White is from Galveston, Texas. All right. And if you've ever been to Galveston, Texas, there's a place in, as you're driving towards the beach, 
That's at the actual place where they used to auction off slaves. Okay. And so um, I talked about that on that radio special because that must have been something that would have formed quite an impression on Barry White as a young man, having to you know ride his bicycle or walk past that point every play, every day on the way to wherever he was going. Because Galveston was a small town. Um, Jack Johnson is also from Galveston, Texas. So um, um, I, I would, and I've spoken to people who have been uh, friends with Barry White, and they said that he was a man that really understood the historical nature of the music and the culture and how it's tied together and all of that stuff and they, they always say you know it's a shame you never got a chance to talk with him by man you would have loved it I, I, like i said i call him the gentle giant mm -hmm. when he laughed he sounded like a little mouse squealing he's a scam i said man you better cut that out <laughs> but but uh um from the day i met him um we just took a liking to each other and and of course Two of his best friends were uh, Jermaine Jackson and uh, Don Cornelius. Mm -hmm. So whenever I would go out to uh, to his house, sometimes uh, Don would be there, and uh, or Jermaine, and, and some of the, the whispers would come out. Scotty and Walter and them would come out. We sit around, and he was very much into music. He didn't go out a lot, and uh, what he did, this brother was so uh, so deep. He he um, the house he lived in. There was another house overlooking him on a hill. He bought that house and built a recording studio in it. So he had two houses and what he would have on his rope pajamas like I have one now, he would get in in his car and drive up the hill to work every morning to go in his studio. Right? <laughs> and, and there was and this brother could eat, me and him used to eat off platters. We would throw down man. But anyway in the evening he would get in his little car and ride on down from the hill man back to the house. You know? And um private person but I must say one night he called me up about 10 o'clock he said man I'm coming over to your house I said you lie and he used to love to play this card game Uno mm -hmm. he came over in his in his house shoes and, I, and then put a robe and stuff and I had on my stuff and clothes <laughs> and the glow in and we sat there and played Uno for a couple of hours then he surprised me again he said um okay I'll come to OJ's show if Don come with me. So we played the theater in Beverly Hills on Wilshire Boulevard. And Don Cornelius and, and Barry White came to the show. And Barry White hadn't performed in a while. So Don Cornelius introduced, came out, and the audience went crazy. But they used to see him. He was a soul train, right? He used to do a soul train. And then he introduced the maestro. The people went crazy. He couldn't talk. He had the back on everything. He was bending down like this here. And he introduced us. We was one of his favorite groups. And he just went, y'all, the mighty OJs, the way down went to it. And I, I thanked him so much because he, Barry White, didn't go see him. No. He, he didn't go out. And he, so he did a special. He come out one night and played cards with me. And the next time he came to see OJ's performance. After all those years of me giving him tickets and trying to get him to come out. So I have, I have special memories. Uh, I have a special place in my heart for, uh, for Barry White. I have all his music sometimes. Um, when I'm melancholy and reminiscing, I, 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 you know, I put on this stuff and just listen to it. But I do that. See, I'm a romantic, so I, uh, I do that to a lot of music, you know. And, or if I'm riding down the street, then he should come on. Or someone else, uh, you know, in my life that I really admired and I was close to. Uh, I'll just um, have a moment, you know, and just listen to their movies. I mean, sometimes, I'm sorry, I may say that sometimes it could be an actor, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and uh, I'll have a day of just watching, you know, their stuff, you know, or or listen to a particular artist's music. You know, but Barry White was uh, one of my favorite people. He has a special place in my heart, and I miss him dearly. By the way, y'all, Barry White is not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yeah, well, he will be. He will be, but he's not yet. So, um, what are you doing now, Sammy? Uh, I no longer uh, sing. Uh, as of last January, uh, mm -hmm. as this, as of January, last year, yeah, last January. This is a new year. I uh, retired from show business after 47 years. Um, the group, uh, Anthony, I, I had left the OJs, of course, in 92 and went back to regroup uh, with the original group of Louis Anthony Burns. 
My Anthony Clarence had moved to Vegas. Um, I had no desire to move to Vegas. They signed with new management in the agency. I had no desire to sign. And I, 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 they wanted to work around the Vegas area, um, like Gladys Knight, Celine Dion. Hopefully they'll find a venue like that. Um, they're sort of tired of traveling. They're getting old. They're not going to understand it. And I would have had to relocate. And I, I just I just didn't want to do it. So I decided to, uh, hey, 47 years was enough. You know. So my wife and I, the boy, we just spend our time together. Um, we like to do some traveling. You know, I always said I wanted to be in a position one day to to go back to all the places that I really enjoyed, but I had to leave early in the morning on the tour bus. Mm-hmm. And I'd like to go back and stay as long as I want to. Uh, so I call it a vacation for life. You know. Um, so that's what I'm sort of. Uh, I don't wear a watch anymore, so I, I'm not on the schedule. I'm on my my body clock. If I if I'm sleepy, I go to sleep. If I'm hungry, I, I eat. Um, if I want to go out, and I I really don't want much. I enjoy movies. Uh, I like going out to restaurants. It, it don't have to be extravagant. It could be uh, Mickey D's, you know, or Chinese takeout. Um, I collect movies and music. I, I, I have on-demand cable, and basically that's it. I, I, I just like if it's a nice day, I wake up and like, oh baby, let's 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 take a drive down to Atlantic City, and uh, that's really it. And I've never had a chance to do that because um, I was 16, like I said, when I cut my first hit record, 16, 17, back in uh, the Roy 50s, and. Um, I'll be 66 this year. So in other words, and yeah, you live you live in New Jersey. You live 10 minutes away from me, and you say you have all kinds of time on your hands. No, I have no time on my hands. You missed my point. No, you missed my point. Now, Charlie Atkins used to tell me something. God bless his soul. Time that you enjoy wasting is not a waste of time. Mm-hmm. And what I'm doing now is enjoying my life. I have exhaled. I don't have to rush for anything. When I when I tell you, I've never had the pleasure of just loafing. I've worked for 47 years, you know what I'm saying? Uh, I feel, um, I still have dreams, but they have nothing really to do with uh, uh, show business. I think that the Creator, um, God the Creator has really blessed me. And a lot of people say to me, well, you don't really look as, as old as you are. Uh, I don't think, how can you age when you've been living your dream for 47 years? Something that you actually got down on your knees and asked God for, and at 16, you had already cut your first hit record. And then, of course, then after that, it went downhill, you know, but I sang with different groups and whatnot. But all my life, I've actually been living my dream. Something that I, I just... I was in the top balcony, nosebleed section at the Apollo Theater, watching the Spaniels and the Moon Glows and the Heart Tones, and heard the people screaming. And I was a little juvenile, delinquent, little gangs and whatnot. And I was feared, well, man, you won't get past 16, you know. And I said, you know, it's got to be something else. And I got kicked out of school. I said, Lord, if you could, maybe if I could sing, and I had never sang in my life, if I could cut his records and be a show business, you know, that would work. Well, the next year I was on that stage. I had I had cut my my first hit record. The next very year I was on that same stage. I've been a show business ever since. In that point, in 47 years. So I actually, asked the creator for something. So dreams do come true. Wishes come true. Prayers come true. Uh, you also have to be very disciplined and determined, and not take no for an answer. You have to be able to uh, have your heart broken, uh, disappointed, lied to, cheated, you know, all those things. Uh, and if you have all those ingredients, uh, it could probably happen for you. But I, but I tell all young people, dream. You know, that's what all this is, is created from a dream. So as long as you dare to dream, and people used to ask me, well, when I say the word Frankie Lyman and the teenagers, what do you think of? What comes to mind? I say hope, um, 
there's a chance I said I could dare dream and my dream will come true because Frankie Lyman and the teenagers were the Jackson 5 of their time right so here I was a kid teeny bopper saying well not only after hearing people tell me oh you'll never make it or them telling other people that I realized that when Frankie Lyman and the teenagers came out not only could I dare to dream but there was a chance that my dream could come true and I tell that to young people today, dare to dream. You know, don't be afraid to ask to create, hey, bend your knees, ask the creator, or you could be on riding in your car or walking down the street because you could talk to the creator any time of the day and night, anywhere. And don't be afraid to dream and, 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 and ask for guidance, you know. And um, hey, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> Well, you know what? I think this is, that's a perfect way to, to end this interview. And thank you so much for spending this amount of time with My me. pleasure. Um, I really appreciate oh, it. Oh, I have it. I want to uh, add something on that. You know, uh, all of us have been given the greatest gift of all time. We've been given human life from the Creator. All of us say God the Creator, or Buddha, or Allah, Jehovah, whatever. Uh, your uh, religious affiliation may be. But your gift to the Creator for the gift of life is what you do with your life. Mm -hmm. Right? Because you've been given the greatest thing in the world. And your appreciation for this gift is what you do with it. And now I'll leave you. Absolutely. <laughs> Hey, it's been a pleasure, brother. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sammy. It's been it's been a, it's been more than a pleasure. It's an honor because I just learned a whole lot, and I think everybody else did too. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs>